Federalist Number One by Alexander Hamilton to the people of the state of New York. After unequivocal experience of the inefficiency of the subsisting federal government, you are called upon to deliberate on a new constitution for the United States of America. The subject speaks of its own importance, comprehending its consequences nothing less than the existence of the Union, the safety and welfare the parts of which is composed, the fate of an empire in many respects the most interesting in the world. It has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country, by their conduct and example, to decide the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. If there be any truth in the remark, the crisis at which we are arrived may be, with propriety, be regarded as the error in which the decision is to be made, and a wrong election on the part which we shall act may, in this view, deserve to be considered as a general misfortune of mankind. So here at the start, he's saying a couple things. He's saying that the Articles of Confederation have proven not to be successful and we need a new constitution, the one that we would eventually adopt. And he's also saying that it seems to us that we are in a position to do something truly unique. We are in a position to, among free men, decide what our government is going to be. You know, other governments of the past have come into existence through fate or by the sword or by other mechanisms. And we here are going to try to peacefully decide for ourselves, perhaps for the first time ever in history, what our government should be. And so we are left with this task to see if it's possible. Is it possible for people to get together and form a government of their own free will, or is this not a thing that can happen? Is it only fate that determines what governments exist? So can we do this or not is the first question. This idea will add inducements of philanthropy to those of patriotism to hide in the solitude which all considerate and good men must feel for the event. Happy it will be if our choice should be directed by judicious estimate of true interests, unperplexed and unbiased by considerations not connected with the public good. But this is a thing more ardently to be wished than seriously to be expected. The plan offered to our deliberations affects too many particular interests innovates upon too many local institutions, not to involve its discussion a variety of objects foreign to its merits, and of views, passions, and prejudice little favorable to the discovery of truth. So here he's saying it would be nice if we could have a discussion that came from a veil of ignorance, where we were all coming from some sort of ethereal plane and only were discussing the merits of the issue totally removed from any of our own individual interests. If we were able to truly form a government based on what is good for the collective whole rather than what is good for any of us. And he's pointing out that this is rather a more of a wish than an expectation. He's pointing out that this is not a thing we can do. Men are biased by their own nature. Everyone is biased by their own incentives. And so he's saying that we need to factor the fact in that people have incentives. You know, we, we shouldn't pretend that we have descended from on high and we are here purely a spirit. We should instead recognize the fact that we're a human, we are fallible, and therefore we need to recognize that reality as we're trying to form this new government. Among the most formidable of the obstacles which the new constitution will have to encounter may be readily distinguished the obvious interest of a certain class of men in every state to resist all changes which may hazard a diminution of power emolument, and consequence of the offices they hold under state establishments, and the perverted ambition of another class of men who will either hope to aggrandize themselves by the confusions of their country, or will flatter themselves with fair prospects of elevation from subdivision of the empire into several partial confederacies, then from its union under one government. Here he's pointing out the obvious truth that people are biased by their incentives, particularly those in the current political class those with current political power, those with current political station, those with current political title, are going to be much less likely to, in the spirit of the pure ethereal, establish a new government which does not recognize or give them power. You know, they're unlikely to give up what they want. And he's also pointing out that this isn't just an issue of the powerful. He's also pointing out it's an issue of the less powerful. He's pointing out that the less powerful may use this opportunity to create chaos, which will elevate their station personally, 
and may um, create incentives that way. So this is both an issue of those that do have power and those that don't have power. Uh, both have perverse incentives that are not um, reflected in the pure ethereal truth that we would ideally like to reach. So let's make sure that we're keeping track of both interests. It is not, however, my design to dwell upon observations of this nature. I am well aware that it would be disingenuous to resolve indiscriminately the opposition of any set of men, merely because their situations might subject them to suspicion, into interested or ambitious views. Candor will oblige us to admit that even such men may be actuated by upright intentions, and it cannot be doubted that much of the opposition which has made its appearance, or may hereafter make its appearance, will spring from sources, blameless at least, if not respectable, the honest errors of minds led astray by preconceived jealousies and fears. So numerous indeed and so powerful are the causes that serve to give false bias to judgment that we may, upon many occasions, see wise and good men on the wrong as well as on the right side of questions of the first magnitude of society. This circumstance, if duly attended to, would furnish a lesson on moderation of those who are ever so much persuaded of their being in the right of any controversy. And a further reason for caution in this respect might be drawn from the reflection that we are not always sure that those who have advocated the truth are influenced by pure principles than their antagonists. Ambition, Erebus, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these are apt to operate as well as those who support as those who oppose the right side of a question. Were there not even inducements to moderation, nothing could be more ill-judged than the intolerant spirit which has, at times, characterized political parties. For in politics, as religion, it's equally absurd to aim at making proselytes by fire and sword. Heresies can either be rarely cured by persecution. So he's saying a whole bunch of stuff in this paragraph. He's saying that everyone is biased, everyone has biases, and there are going to be good men on both sides of any political question that we have. You know, there are going to be both people, and even good people might occasionally be on the wrong side of issues due to biases they don't even know they have. So he's basically calling everyone out. He's And he's also saying, don't be too sure of your own intentions. Don't be too sure that you're on the side of the righteous and the side of the angels, you know, because you are subject to your own biases, some of which you don't know necessarily, um, to reach certain conclusions. So you yourself may be one of the good men on the wrong side of the issue. You know, it's not just because, you know, you think that you're pure of mind and have, you know, the best of intentions that you are necessarily reaching the right conclusions, because probably there's someone on the other side who is thinking along those same lines. So, you know, this is check your own bias and give the other side a little bit of favorable treatment because they might be biased just as you would be if you were in their position. So don't assume you're pure. And he's also saying that this is an issue with political parties in the same way as religion, which is something we've definitely seen recently in recent times where it has become more religious in sort of, a, you know, expelling the unpure and, you know, preaching to the righteous and the other side is the devil, right? We've seen this. And he's saying that both in politics and religion, trying to convert people by the sword doesn't work. Rather, it's something to be cured by persuasion. So he's saying, you know, be careful that you are not biased. Be careful that you don't fall into the scheme of the righteous. Be careful that, you know, you give your side, other side the assumption that they are acting under the same incentives you are, that you're not of some special class. And also, we shouldn't go to war over this. You know, we can't convert people by force. We have to convert people by words. So, you know, fire and sword is not going to be the way to solve this, this problem. Everyone has ambition. Everyone has animosity. Everyone has bias. Check yourself before you wreck yourself and make sure that you are looking at this with a proper uh, charity to everyone. And yet, however, just these sentiments will be allowed to be. We have already sufficient indications that it will happen in this, as in all former cases of great national discussion. A torrent of angry and malignant passions will let loose. To judge from the conduct of opposing parties, we shall be led to conclude that they will mutually hope to evince the justness of their opinions and to increase the number of converts by loudness of the declarations and the bitterness of the invectives. 
and enlightened zeal for energy and efficiency of government will be stigmatized as the offspring of temperate, found on despotic power and hostile to the principles of liberty, an over-scrupulous jealousy of danger to the rights of people, which is more commonly the fault of the head than of the heart, will be represented as mere pretense and artifice, the stale bait for popularity at the expense of pop public good. It will be forgotten, on the one hand, that jealousy is usually concomitant of love, and that noble enthusiasm of liberty is apt to be infected with a spirit of narrow and illiberal distrust. On the other hand, it will be equally forgotten that the vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty, that, in contemplation of a sound and well-informed judgment, their interests can never be separated, and that the dangerous ambition more often lurks behind the specious mac of zeal for the rights of the people, rather than the forbidden appearance of zeal for the firmness and efficiency of government. History teaches us that the former has been much more certain roads to the introduction of despotism than the later, and those men who have overturned the liberty of republics, the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequiat court to the people, commencing demagogues and ending tyrants. So Alexander Hamilton here is saying the battle has already started. You know, we've, we've seen the first, um, the first salvo, salvos in this, uh, this fight. You know, we've already seen this begin to start. You know, the rumblings and, you know, the, the calm before the storm or the little rustlings we've seen that this is going to be a thing. And we will, we will soon forget all of our good intentions in the spirit of the fight. Um, and, you know, he's also saying here that there, there are two dangers. There's the danger of government and there's the danger of liberty, uh, danger of anarchy. Um, and he's saying, you know, that government's is purpose is to, for the security of people. And government's um, in, in, legitimate interest is in protecting people both from without, that is, from other powers, and from within, that is, from themselves. Um, people sometimes are jerks to others, and, you know, the government's purpose is to provide security uh, from your fellow countrymen and to allow you to operate safely. And he's saying that, you know, we, there may be issues where people are challenging the legitimacy of government. Uh, they may call for a more liberal policy, but he's saying that most tyrannies start that way. He's saying most tyrannies start with an appeal to the people. Most tyrannies start with um, the person who is going to overthrow the, the, the current order uh, saying that you, the people, have been deposed. Um, you, the people, should be given power. Um, this current government doesn't represent you. Let's overthrow the government. So he's saying most tyrannies begin with a populist appeal. Um, so we should be careful that the populist appeal doesn't take the day because that's how tyranny sometimes start. Now, I would be somewhat remiss if I didn't point out that that doesn't mean that populism per se is tyranny. He's just saying that, you know, tyrants can use this mechanism. Um, and we've seen this happen in the past of history. We've seen tyrants um, use this mechanism to liberate the people and then immediately create a tyranny under the new order. So he's like, well, you should be cautious of government because government can do a lot of bad things. But you should also be cautious of those who are calling for abolition of government because they're probably incentivized by their own power. They're probably using it as a ruse to overthrow the government in favor of one in which they have control. And we've seen many examples of that both in history and in popular culture. So they, the tyrant comes um, in the voice of the people and uses that as a springboard uh, to power. Um, whether or not that is reflective of any current political situation, uh, I will not speculate. Uh, because I don't think it is the case that populism per se is tyranny. It's just saying that it's a motive of tyrants and it's a tool of tyrants. So beware. In the course of preceding observations, I have had an eye, my fellow citizens, to putting you upon your guard against all attempts from whatever quarter to influence your decision in a matter of the utmost moment to your welfare by any impressions other than those which may result from the evidence of truth. You will, no doubt, at the same time, have been collected from the general scope of them, that they proceed from a source not unfriendly to the new constitution. Yes, my countrymen, I owe you that. After giving it my attentive consideration, I am clearly of the opinion it is to your interest to adopt it. I am convinced this is the safest course for your liberty, your dignity, and your happiness. I affect not reserves which I do not feel. 
I will not assume you with the appearance of deliberation when I've decided. I frankly acknowledge to you my convictions, and I freely lay before you the reasons on which they are founded. The consciousness of good intentions dis disdains ambiguity. I shall not, however, multiply professions on this head. My motives must remain in the depository of my own breast. My arguments will be open to all and may be judged by all. They shall be offered in a spirit which shall not disgrace them the cause of truth. Here he's saying, take guard, because you're being asked to consider the most important matters possible. Like, what kind of constitution should we have? Pretty important. So take guard. And he's also saying that I'm going to just tell you flat out that I think this is a good idea. I'm not going to try to hide my intentions. I'm not going to try to pretend I'm deliberating when I'm not. I'm just going to come to you honestly and speak boldly. I'm just going to say flat out that I think this new constitution is a good idea. And, you know, I'm just going to tell you that it is. And I'm not going to tell you like my own subjective reasons, but you can judge my arguments. So I believe it's a good idea. I think you should adopt it. I think it's good for liberty. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. And just be flat out honest, totally open that th this is what I think you should do. I propose in a series of papers, that would be the Federalist Papers, to discuss the following interest particulars. The utility of the Union to your political prosperity, the insufficiency of the present Confederation to preserve that Union, the necessity of a government at least equal energetic to the one proposed, the attainment of this object, the conformity of the proposed Constitution to the true principles of Republican government, its analogy to your own state constitution, and lastly, the additional security which its adoption will afford to the preservation of that species of government to liberty and property. This is the question I think you should consider. This is why I think it's a good idea. I think it's going to maximize liberty and property and maximize the Republican form of government, and the current constitution, the current Articles of Confederation are not working for us, and I think this is going to work much better. In the progress of this discussion, I shall endeavor to give a satisfactory answer to all the objections which shall have made their appearance that may seem to claim your attention. As you might anticipate when considering a new constitution, there are a lot of skepticism and skepticism that is warranted. He himself is saying you should be skeptical. And there have been a lot of objections to a lot of this for a lot of reasons, many of which are very valid. And so he's saying, well, I'm going to endeavor to try to answer all your objections and show you why even despite all those concerns, this is the best way to go. Not that your concerns are invalid, but given everything, this is the best balance. So I'm going to try to persuade you. It may perhaps be thought superfluous to offer arguments that prove the utility of the Union, a point, no doubt, deeply engraved on the hearts of the great body of the people in every state, and one which it may be imagined has no adversaries. But the fact is, we've already heard it whispered in the private circles of those who oppose the new constitution, that the 13 states are of too great extent for any general system, and we must of necessity resort to separate confederacies of distinct portions of the whole. This doctrine will, in all probability, be gradually propagated till its votaries enough continents to open a vow of it. For nothing can be more evident to those who are able to take in a large view of the subject than the alternating of an adoption of a new constitution or dismemberment of the Union. It will therefore be of use to begin by examining the advantages of the Union, that certain evils and probable dangers to which every state will be exposed from its disillusionment. This shall accordingly constitute the subject of my next address. So basically here he's saying, whether or not it's true or not, but he's basically saying that, you know, it's generally accepted that Union is a good idea. Um, by people. So it, why would you argue for a union? Because it's generally accepted as a good idea. And he's saying, as he was alluding to earlier, we've already heard murmurs. You know, we've already heard the whispers in the wind that perhaps this union thing is not such a good idea. Perhaps what we should do is form smaller groups. Perhaps each state should be a sovereign country or there should be smaller confederacies. You know, this is, this is too big, you know, for what we're trying to do. It's, it's going to be too much to try to unify under one banner. Um, so every state should be an independent nation or there should be smaller groups or whatever. But, you know, they're basically the argument is that there's no union that could ever manage this many states. So, so we should each go it our own way. Um, and he's saying, well, I'm going to argue against that. And by proving to you why the union is actually a good idea, why, you know, despite whatever appeal there might be in the idea of let's each go our own way, 
Um, rather, it's a good idea for us all to stay together. And yes, we can administer this under one banner. So that is basically what he's saying. And I'm going to address that in the next argument. So very good. And of course, it was signed Publius because it was anonymous at the time it was written. So that is the end of Federalist number one. In Federalist number one, we learned what Alexander Hamilton and his cohorts are arguing for in the Federalist Papers. We argued that they are going to explain why the Constitution is a good idea, why it's not a good idea for people to go it alone. He's also going to explain why we need to persuade each other and to check our own motives as we give assumption of good motives to our opposition and that we can expect good people to potentially be on the wrong side of arguments. So we need to make sure to give each other charity in this and we do not descend into political tribalism as we're trying to do this, that we try to do this with recognition that everyone has their own biases, everyone has their own incentives, and we should make sure to try to do this in a light that is favorable to those, um, those biases. And I, the writer of this, which we now know to be Alexander Hamilton, I'm going to just tell you flat out that I think it's a good idea. I'm not going to try to hide the ball. I'm going to tell you I think it's a good idea. We shouldn't go our own way, and the union is great. So a very good introduction to the Federalist Papers. You know, he's setting it out, the purpose of it, he's saying, you know, that everyone's biased, I have biases, but I'm going to tell you flat out what I think, and the union, the new constitution, is a really good idea, so you should support it. And that is the end of this for now. I hope you're well. Until later, cheers and goodbye.